S in Hell, a look back at Saturday Night Live with your hosts, Matt and Keith. Brought to you by Lion's Den Audio Theater. Like and subscribe to Lion's Den Audio Theater for more Lion's Den goodness. And here are your hosts, Keith and Matt. Hello, everyone. Welcome to SN Hell. My name is Keith. With me, as always, is my old buddy, Matt. Hello, Matt. Hello. How are things tonight, Matt? Not too bad, thanks. How are you? Doing well, doing well. We've got a few of our third chairs here tonight. We've got Ron with us tonight. How you doing? Good to see you. Doing well, buddy. And Chili? Don't you hello, Chili me. (laughs) Joining us tonight, Rebecca. Hello, Rebecca. Hello, fellas. I guess I'm the token female tonight. Glad to be here. And what a toke. <laughs> Just going back in the history of SNL, in the original original episodes, we had Albert Brooks, a uh, famed comedian filmmaker, would come in. For the first handful of episodes, he did these short movies. Uh, Matt, he was getting paid $1,000 a minute and uh, took advantage of that, perhaps with a 13-minute heart surgery film. I mean, I don't remember them too fondly by any means, but there's some of Gary Weiss movies, uh, films that I don't remember super fondly either. So you win some, you lose some, you know? For sure. We were actually quite delighted when Albert finished and Gary Weiss came in. Um, And maybe as we go through this, we'll, uh, we'll talk about sort of why we were so excited at the beginning um and then it sort of faded out but tonight we're going through almost all of gary weiss's offerings from the first three seasons of snl one that i missed is actually there's one where he's uh he's following some men who are painting graves in the new orleans cemetery that one i just forgot because it aired during the the mardi gras special and uh, I don't think that would have made the top of anyone's list. So when we get what we're going to do is we're going to go through these pretty much chronologically how they first aired. When we get to the end, we'll we'll pick our favorite. So everyone's going to name their top five if they can. <laughs> and we'll uh, we'll then total it up very similar to how we did on our best sketch of season one episode. Make sense to everyone? Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Uh, first off, I just wanted to ask the panel, uh, thoughts of short movies being part of Saturday Night Lore? It, I mean, Albert Brooks was there, Gary Weiss. Now in our timeline, we are seeing uh, Tom Schiller start to uh, emerge. And of course, later, like the Lonely Island guys with their digital shorts and such. Uh, what do you think of these things that aren't music and aren't sketches appear on the show throughout? They've gotten better over the years. You know, different people have different opinions on which era of Saturday Night Live is the best? I think people tend to look back pretty n- nostalgically, but it's probably one of the rare things I will say that despite as I'm getting older, I find I'm enjoying the newer versions of this type of segment more than I did the ones even back when I was younger. I would say it's interesting. They kind of, you know, as they go on in this list you compiled, just become sketches again. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but the ones that are like actual artsy short films they're hit and miss yeah they're definitely hit and miss but i do find it adds an interesting element to the show it does make it feel like not just a sketch comedy thing sometimes they're a little hard to get through but it still does bring something to it to make it feel like it's a little more i don't know maybe variety show ish or or an interesting art experiment at the very least yeah yeah so yeah before we jump in just one quick bit i mean this was gary weiss it was experimental film he tries a whole bunch of things it really seems like he throws everything against the wall sees what sticks and uh, it's certainly a different time when a lot of things like music videos were still you know some novelty to that you know so um i'm interested to to see uh, you know as we go through this what everybody's thoughts are on the individual pieces the other thing I will say is that we all watched, you know, an hour and a half of Gary Weiss films back to back. That's not how they were intended to be consumed, but it, it's how we did consume them on this particular occasion. Some of them are very much slice of life type uh, videos, yep. and much like slices of pie. You only want to have one or two in a row. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Yeah. So let's go right in. Uh, Homeward Bound. This is one of the more famous ones. It's the first one that uh, that we saw uh, and, and, and noted it as a Gary Weiss film. It's people 
meeting loved ones at the airport. Now, uh, it's very sentimental, very sappy, very maudlin, and I've even said saccharine. There were two different ways of, of watching this. There is the way it was intended and the way I'm sure people watched it, where it's this loving movie of these wonderful people getting together for the first time in a long time and all the things about missing loved ones and all that stuff. And then there's the way we watched it. And uh, Matt, um, can you, <laughs> you said it a lot better than I did. What's the problem with showing the Homeward Bound video on uh, on Christmas and then again on Valentine's Day? I mean, if you're alone, it makes you want to kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> so uh, where's everyone thinking with Homeward Bound? Uh, did it touch you in the sweet way or did it make you kind of want to vomit? Matt just said this is actually one of the very few Gary Weiss films that did not make me want to kill myself. <laughs> It's, you know, it's saccharine, it's sweet, it is what it's supposed to be, but it's it doesn't overstay its welcome. And I'm sure maybe at the time it might have been a novel idea, so I don't mind this one as much. I think this one would probably play just as well today as it did, you know, almost 50 years ago. I don't understand what they hope to accomplish with this. Like, who is this for? I, I think it was long. Why is it so long? I know the show is struggling with its identity in the early years, but this is a United Airlines commercial without the logo. You can't help but you know, be happy when you see other people happy. But as a short film or given as an example of short films, the camera work is horrible. The audio is terrible. It it looks like somebody just picked up their video camera when they're 15 and shot a bunch of stuff at the airport. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what it was. It does have like a home video quality to it. But for me, that lends it lends to the sincerity I don't know. I, it is definitely like sweet, but there's also something really genuine and I don't know, pleasant about it that uh, got got my sappy buttons pressed. Yeah, guys, I think you uh, you're all a bunch of wusses. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little too gaggy, um, especially for the show that it's on. No, it's not. I don't think it's the place for it. Um, maybe it belongs in the Hallmark Channel or something, but uh, definitely not something I think for Saturday Night Live. Sure. Okay, so we're more split on that than I thought we'd be, actually. I think, Matt, you and I, in in the original viewing, it was D as well. We were all like, what the hell? But it was shorter and probably more enjoyable in a way than than the Albert Brooks stuff we had seen up to that point. The next one is one Matt really enjoyed. It's, uh, at the time, it's a bunch of lounge singers uh, intercut singing the Johnny Mathis song Misty. Um, definitely strange uh, material. Uh, Matt loved the aesthetic. Let's. Uh, I'm going to throw it right to you, Matt. Talk about this a little bit, and then I'd love to hear what everyone else has to say. I still like it. I did find the editing a bit more jarring this time when I watched it, and I would listen to any of these old bastards singularly sing Misty. What a good song. Play Misty for me. Uh, it, it does seem like a bit of a film experiment gone wild, but I still liked it. I still thought it was charming, and uh, yeah, good for them. Good for those old bastards. I actually didn't like this one, but I would say, you know, Play Misty for me is a good movie. Probably came out around the same time as this. Watch that instead. This looked like it was filmed in a cave. So out of context, you can't really enjoy the music per se. Weird that way, but you know, it's artsy. Yeah, it's definitely artsy. It's definitely, you know, you know, I do I didn't really enjoy it mostly because the different tempos of each singer, things like that, it just didn't seem to flow as well as I think it could have. Um, had it been maybe something that they tried today and cut together a bit today, um, with our, you know, better technology and whatnot. Uh, but for the time, it probably was, you know, really good. Uh, but I don't think it, you know, stands the test of time for sure. Um, and I just didn't really enjoy it that much. Yeah, it could definitely stand from going through some more modern editing techniques. <laughs> that's for sure. But mm-hmm. it did make me also want to be in a dark, smoke-filled room with a glass of whiskey listening to some old guy just fucking tickle some ivories. So yeah. I don't know. I didn't mind it too much. It was a little jarringly janky, but it did evoke a feeling, which is, I guess, what it's going for. So it did something. I was going to say, it is an interesting snapshot of that world of lounge singing back in yeah. the 70s. You Because know? we'd be hard pressed to go to, I'd be hard pressed to go to any bar and find an old man sitting at a piano singing Misty today. 
Our next one is uh, the funniest person in Irvington, New York. One of my favorites, uh, Buck Henry, is in Irvington, and he's going from person to person to try to find out who they think is the funniest person in town. They wind up uh, settling on a lady who agrees that she is indeed the funniest person in town. Another slice of life one. This is the first one actually in this segment that is that uh i really enjoyed this one i thought it was pretty good and and honestly you could probably go to any small town and uh and and ask the same question and come up with a whole bunch of different results i really liked this one myself me too that was marie yes marie she said marie she yeah the uh great use of buck who was just excellent with people uh even though he did look like i wrote that he looks like a 70s swarthy pervert sometimes <laughs> uh, it was trench coat and glasses <laughs> i like how decidedly unfunny the chief was he's like nope not me not funny uh, that, that really got a, a big laugh out of me, ironically. Yeah, this one almost feels like um, it's ahead of its time. There's like yeah. almost a meta joke running through it where everyone's just being so flat and normal. And it's like, so I hear you're the funniest guy in town. Oh, well, I don't know, maybe. That's so <laughs> well, though. You know, like no one's telling any jokes. No one's being funny. And there's something about that that ends up being hilarious by the end of it. The only one I enjoyed would have been the uh, the police chief. Everything else, uh, I kind of find it's, like you said, you could go to any you know small town and ask this, but there just wasn't any jokes in this thing talking about the funniest guy in town, and none of them said Gary Weiss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Julie, I think you're right. Um, it was it was all right. It was you know funny, and I enjoyed that the woman at the end was like, yeah, totally, it's me. Nothing to be like, yeah, I, I, I'm hilarious. I tell jokes all the time. Like, there's no proof of anyone being at all funny for any of them. But I just love that the woman at the end was totally like, yeah, of course. <laughs> now the Paramount Novelty Store. We have a, a little uh, old lady who runs a novelty store. The Paramount Novelty Store was still there, actually, when I or a version of it was still there when we first recorded this. Um, just your typical, um, I don't want to say granny, but I guess, uh, elderly lady going through and showing us things like whoopee cushions and, and the Polish mug and black soap and bloody soap. I loved this because of her. It wouldn't have worked if it was a 20 year old guy. Um, her absolute whimsy at all this wacky stuff was awesome. Yeah. I just, this is certainly one of my favorites and one of the ones that have stuck with me over the years. They, they called it a poo-poo cushion. Great seller, the yes. poo-poo cushion. Fun at parties. Practical jokes. Uh, the salad, in, this this was awesome. The salad insects uh, were great. It uh, kind of reminded me of, uh, what, what was it called in our town, Keith? Big Boppers? Yeah, it was Big Boppers. Big Boppers. Yeah, charming old lady. Uh, she could get the laugh of the party, she said. <laughs> the uh yeah when she, keith you're right when she's she's so whimsical that she's talking about how people oh they'll get so frightened and excited over it and when she says polish jokes are so very popular uh another good laugh and holy shit when they cut to her with the glasses and the stash on it was my matthew ryan laugh of the night thank god i don't have access to this store i would be the city's worst prop comic <laughs> Yeah, I'm a, I'm a simple fella, and as the thousands, if they've been paying attention and keeping notes, the second I heard poo-poo cushion, I was sold. She had me right out of the gate. And uh, yeah, her her absolute delight in in all these goofy little gags just sells the shit out of this for me. She's, she's enthusiastic, but not. She's so flat and straight. You know, yeah. she's not a funny person. That's what made it so such a gem. Yeah, she could be talking about yarn. Totally. Yeah. I found this one was actually a better version of the last sketch where mm -hmm. it was almost like dealing with funny things in a not funny way, but she was much more entertaining and it, it took place in one spot and she was delightful and uh, she loved working at the joke shop, you can tell, but I don't think she herself is probably that funny, but that's what made it great. That's what made it work, yeah. I just couldn't get over how much stuff was crammed into there and how she found anything because it just seemed to be a debacle of stuff all piled on top of each other. The only part I kind of got a little chuckle out of was the here's the soap that turned your hair, your hands black. And here's the one that looks exact same, but it turns your hands bloody. bloody yeah. <laughs> Our next one is two gentlemen who look remarkably alike. Actually, there is a, a tailor. 
and a plastic surgeon, and they're both commenting on the other's appearance and how they would improve it. Uh, this one was okay for me. I, I got a kick out of it. I really kind of like how the two men were, were were strikingly similar in appearance. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, I thought it was funny that the uh, plastic surgeon was going to tailor the face, and uh, the tailor was going to cut up the uh, suit. So, you know, a little role reversal. Yeah, I found they did look quite a bit alike, one with longer hair and balding and the other one with shorter hair and balding. And the, the audience got a laugh out of when he uh, when he said, here we have an attractive man <laughs> and you could hear the laughter in the background. Uh, dude in the picture looks like a, a little bit like a bald Ted Bundy. I couldn't help but notice. And I really thought the pointer with the, the guy, uh, the suit man with his giant pointer going over the, the suit was unintentionally funny. Same thing, though. I found it just kind of went on without too much jokes. Once you realize that, well, once you realize what the concept was and how it was, you know, the two men evaluating each other. Uh, I didn't find there was too much after that. I went on for another couple minutes. Yeah, to Matt's point, when when the guy mentions that it's an attractive man and the audience starts laughing, then the camera pans out and you get your first look at the surgeon and he looks so similar to him. I had a pretty hard laugh at that. And the comically large pointer also got me a little bit, but it does go on a little too long. Like the idea is there, it's executed, and then it just keeps going and going. I like this one. I thought it was a clever concept. And it's like if somebody handed me a camera and said, quick come up with a short film for tonight's show this is something i would do our next bit is just a very short one it's the a bunch of children doing the pledge of allegiance it then cuts to garrett as uh reuben hurricane carter saying liberty for and justice for all um this was just one of those things that was around when the hurricane was trying to be um, exonerated for the crimes it's a political statement at a very heated political time the sincerity in Garrett's delivery, though, and like the eye contact he makes and the tone of voice he takes is a little bit of a gut punch. It gets you. It was good and it was short. Next one is another one I enjoyed immensely. It was on my top 10 for season one. Taylor Mead and his cat. Taylor Mead, an old crony of Andy Warhol, poet, artist, various other things, hanging out with his cat that he found in the uh, building. He gets embalmed on catnip, and uh, I just I find Taylor Mead a very interesting, hilarious character, and him and his cat are just uh, the way they sort of play off each other really works really well. So I, I really enjoyed this. One. I think I said at the time, and I'll say it again here, but for the grace of God, go I. If in ten, fifteen years I am this man, I'm not surprised. <laughs> Uh, although I would absolutely have my cat altered. He said his cat is unaltered. Catch him in, catch them in the middle of a spray. You cut it down about 50%. This man's apartment stinks. There's no doubt about it. It definitely stinks. Yeah, it was still funny. Yeah, I mean, he seemed like a delightful guy, but at the end of the day, it was just uh, five minutes of a guy talking about his cat. So I can't really say too much about it. I mean, he seemed nice. The cat seemed nice. To be fair, he talked about the cat for around three minutes, and he talked to the cat for about two. <laughs> the inverse to that is Bill Wegman and Man Ray. It's uh, Bill Wegman, photographer with his, his famous dog Man Ray, who's doing all these little tricks. This is one I remember Chili watched with us the first time through. I didn't particularly enjoy this one. Chili hated it. Um, Matt was um, not huge on it either. So uh, maybe you guys can kick it off, Chili and Matt. Nice shot of the World Trade Center. Can't see that anymore. Fucking pointless dog tricks. Take your dog outside, sir. Yeah, this is pure dog shit. I think this is the first one of his that I've seen. And it's a guy doing tricks with his dog. And then for some reason at the very end, it's a shot of the World Trade Center. Like, what is this doing on television? Uh, I like artsy stuff. I like experimental stuff. If it has some type of point or secret joke behind it, just watching bored looking people doing kind of boring, average, mundane shit like, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, this is torture. I hate this. And particularly watching it right after the cat one, I was just like, oh, is this like a theme now or what's going on here it felt a little one note and i don't know if anyone else felt this but when he did the trick where he laid on the floor with a cookie in his mouth 
you know what? A little too long there. Like that that went on too long with the dog just licking at his face. I don't know what that was all about. To, to paraphrase Artie Lang from uh, Dirty Work, it's like, yeah, he's definitely fucking that dog, right? <laughs> <laughs> Chili has referred to this as the sketch where the guy makes out with his dog. We now go to cats and dogs. Uh, It's a bunch of people with their pets uh, sort of (laughs) finishing the triumvirate here. We have Jackie Curtis, Constance Abernathy, Elaine Kaufman, Dan Greenberg, and some B-roll from Taylor Mead and Bill Wegman. Just short bits about people talking about their animals. And and I I think the context here is people were less upfront about their 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 closeness with their animals at the time which you know again this was another one it fell a little flat for me though a couple of bits i liked jackie curtis and uh, dan greenberg and again seeing taylor mead again this feels like maybe one of those things that doesn't age super well looking back from modern day because most people nowadays can't shut up about their cats or their dogs and that's great you know pets are cool but this, yeah, after the the last two, especially, like I said, there's a couple of little laughs, like when the lady's talking about her lap dog, all it does is sit in my lap and pass wind, you know, <laughs> I got a chuckle there, but I was uh, very happy when this was over. How can you make videos about cute animals, boring and stupid? These people did it. And like you said, we watched this three in a row, like, I would say Weiss probably had an idea of like, I'm going to go film people with their, you know, with their pets. And, you know, uh, what's the name? Terry Mead, the guy with the cast. Like, he probably said, you know what? His whole thing is too good. I'll make it something separate. So watching this back to back to back probably made me more sick of this one than I would be. It's going to be a recurring theme, so I'll try not to repeat the same thing over and over again. But slice of life stuff is good if it looks like a life where you actually want to (laughs) to live it. (laughs) Uh, so that, this wasn't the most offensive thing on the batch, but it was just bad placement in terms of how we watched it. I may have enjoyed it more on an actual episode. And Jackie Curtis, the uh, subject of the third verse of uh, Lou Reed's Wild Side. We're away from animals, although there is a dog in this named Dumpy. Uh, <laughs> this one is called Garbage, and it follows some sanitation workers in New York. Really like this one. They all talk uh, different. They talk about different experiences they had. There's one guy who really likes to talk about all the dead bodies he's found. Great song, the garbage song. Loved it. Wish it yeah, was Woody on Guthrie. Spotify. Nice. I will go uh, look that up now. Uh, it's like the you know talking about the dead bodies all casual. They start popping up around springtime. It's like it's just casual 70s New York City things. Uh, I did like the guy that was like, well, you know, depends on what's valuable to you. Uh, when they were talking about shit they found. And I uh, wrote that I am extremely skeptical that the reporter blew his own head off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was a hit. You know what? This one was the first one that was actually interesting and actually had good camera work. Like someone was out trying to make a short film instead of just, uh, you know, running around with their home video camera. Yeah, this one was the first one I enjoyed, and it got me thinking, like, I really, I'm sure there's going to be a million examples I'm just missing, but I couldn't think of a single time seeing any type of media where a garbage man was the lead character, so it was just kind of cool to see yeah. into their, you know, their real life. Uh, you'd like them getting the, their moment in the sun, eh, Chili? Yeah, and I would I would also definitely be the garbage man who always talks about all the dead bodies, too. So <laughs> My favorite that. bit from him was like, I thought I saw a leg in the harbor. No, it turned out to be an arm. <laughs> <laughs> There's no yeah, hand. It a, yeah, it wasn't a floating piece of wood or something else. Was no, another piece of the body. Shocking. Um, it was okay. You know, couldn't imagine working in that big pile of garbage. It must have stank. Still don't know why it's a part of SNL. I think I was on the episode when we did this. And uh, as soon as I saw this starting, I actually got excited uh, (laughs) because I remember it quite well. Like this stuck with me for some reason. There's something just about the grittiness and the the genuine. And when they're talking about if they mind being called garbage men or not, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Something about that. Like, oh, the sanitation engineer seems like too much, though. Something really charming and it felt real. And, and yeah, the camera work does seem a little improved. Um, but yeah, no, nah, I really like this. You know, as much, as much as I've liked some of the ones that have, we've talked about already, this is the first one where I think I wanted a little more. Um, like if it had gone another two or three minutes, I wouldn't have been bothered by that. I could listen to that dead body guy all day. <laughs> 
we now go off to uh, Raquel Welch dancing. Um, that's all it is. We're Raquel Welch uh, dancing in front of a white uh, a white backdrop. A nice looking woman moving nicely. A lot of kicking going on. But, uh, you know, my question is, why is it here? My complaint is definitely too long um, and very repetitive in her movements. I think I'm not certainly not a dancer. <laughs> heavy 70s porn vibes. And heavy. <laughs> <laughs> heavy 70s porn music and just like pornography when you're finished with it it just keeps going <laughs> <laughs> yeah i kind of was getting the same vibes there matt i just kept thinking i wonder if this is the first time she's danced with clothes on and as a person who enjoys dance numbers normally um i did not enjoy this one uh it was. It could have been the editing um where they just kept repeating some of her movements over and over again it was not a good dance. I didn't enjoy it. Artistically, as a dancer, it just didn't do it for me. I did write that at least it at least it had some creative photography. Yes. But, I mean, Raquel Welch, that's great. But. Yeah. Yeah, as a fan of Raquel Welch, I mean, I can look at her all day long. Beautiful woman. But I think even with this, I was on the episode where we watched this one. And, I mean, it was just a weird episode anyway because it was so much of – We've already seen so much of Raquel Welsh, and then at the very end, it's just her doing a pretty repetitive dance. But, I mean, it delivered as promised. She looked well, and I'm not a dancer, but she danced well. It just went on for too long, and, yeah, you can't really say anything about it from an artistic point of view. Yeah, it's like she, she was in training for Rochelle Rochelle. <laughs> <laughs> Making her way from Milan to Minsk, eh? Yeah, erotic journey from Milan to Minsk. Minsk. Yeah. No, this is a. Uh, this feels like the end of the night of a kind of sloppy party, and like the hot girl starts dancing, and everyone perks up, and then it goes on for too long, and everyone moves on. <laughs> everyone falls asleep. Yeah. Next one is New York's my home. It's a Ray Charles song, and it's intercut with uh, clips and sounds of uh, sports fans in New York. Didn't do much for me. I, I kind of. I mean, I understood what he was going for. I think in this, because um, New York does have some pretty amazing sports fans sad that the great song was interrupted by the weird editing of people screaming at sports games but yeah this is terrible like i'd move out of new york if i lived in new york after seeing this like, <laughs> i i get it especially in the beginning like snl was very much you know live from new york they liked promoting the fact that they were you know in new york but for these videos here it's very much a case like if you're not from new york people don't give a shit about new york and it just mm. it gets tedious not everybody cares about new york so on a national television show i don't know i find stuff like this is branch out do something yeah. else well new york is the star of the show much like they used to say about law and order yeah and uh and, sex in the city new york is always the fifth girl yeah the idea i get and like maybe it could have worked as a skit having a nice pretty song about other places jarringly interrupted but to just sit through the whole song like that and constantly having it it got pretty grating by the end of it. they reused a lot of the same clips of yelling and all that too so i think it was once again a case of like just they could have been trimmed down by half and it'd be a good 30 second maybe little ha ha palate cleanser yeah but they showed the same woman yelling the same thing several times over and I find just I just find he can get very lazy and repetitive, and this is one where I'm kind of shocked it made it on television. Yeah. yeah. We now go to Niagara Falls. We're intercut between a newly married couple and a couple of private investigators who investigate uh, divorces. And uh, this had a great idea. I, I don't know if it was maybe the the individuals didn't grab me the way they probably could have or something i don't know there was something flat about that but i really like the idea of this one and i really like the look of it i thought it was pretty interesting i it was it was one of the more ones i that i, I found i could watch uh, almost like a, a linear short film uh, it felt like there was development and <laughs> dare i say intrigue uh, as i continue to watch it and uh, i actually found everybody quite interesting i was into it this may be one of the rare ones where it it's kind of opposite, like in terms of what I normally think about his work is that I did like the concept. So I give him credit for that one. Like he had a good concept, but maybe not the best execution. I found the investigators pretty good, but the the couple were bland as bathwater. And for newlyweds, they, I don't know, they just didn't, maybe especially the man, they just didn't 
come off, give off a newlywed vibe. He looked like a guy who was on his way to a, a fucking his deathbed as opposed to just getting married on his honeymoon. I agree with that, Chili. It, it was I wrote that it was bizarre, like not really sure what was going on with it. At least it had a concept. But were they trying to say that this is what was in store for the married couple, the newly married couple? I don't know. It was, it was just kind of a little bizarre. There was definitely sure. something about the the newlywed husband's demeanor that made me think someday these private detectives or the police <laughs> are going to be looking for him for reasons, which kind of added to the back and forth. There was definitely something here. It, it felt a little weirdly put together, but yeah, I, I definitely wanted to hear all of the private eyes stories and cutting back to this newlywed couple that was just, Something was a little off or awkward about them. I, it really worked for me. Yeah, there's like almost foreboding over their joy because, well, these guys talk about all these failed, weird marriage situations. That husband definitely has a room in the house that the wife is not allowed to go in under any <laughs> circumstances. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I kind of wanted to do a search and be like, whatever happened to <laughs> the wife? And the... Yeah, it, it had some really weird, creepy vibes to it. But uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed the stories from the uh, the private eyes. I probably would have just liked to have seen something with just them just telling weird, random stories. I tried looking for any information about these people, didn't find it. So I hope they're still out there and celebrating, I guess it'd be. 48 years of wedded bliss, I hope. Uh, I was just going to say, hopefully she didn't end up becoming a story for one of those New York garbage men. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, This is the one Matt Alba cites as his favorite. It's Buck Henry shopping for toilet seats. Uh, this one's pretty damn good. Um, Matt, I'm going to turn this one over to you. Why is this uh, one of your favorites? Because, uh, first of all, aside from the fact that I have already mentioned, Buck is so good with people. It's such a, a conversational tone, but he knows exactly what he's doing. He's so cunning and he's quick on his feet and he's just great with the people. Why was this my favorite? It was just so strange. And I know what you're thinking. They're all strange, but they, they're not all strange done well. You take the host of the show and uh, now you're cooking. Now I still feel like I'm watching the show and it's not like, holy fuck, did I roll over on the remote? There's some old bastard singing Misty. Uh, so I see Buck Henry. I still feel like I'm watching Saturday night. There are toilet seats. It's just funny anyway. And uh, the earnestness with which it's presented, like, oh my God, like, how do you consider comfort when shopping for a toilet seat? Well, I don't know. Is it the morning or the evening? What kind of an answer is that? You're going to use the same seat and Buck as well so good with people he's like now wait a minute do you have two or do, do you swap them out and the lady who didn't want to keep her money by her ass and oh i, I thought the whole thing was super duper charming i thought it was quite cheeky <laughs> i also enjoyed it guys i thought it was funny i still can't believe that there were that wide a variety of toilet seat covers it was quite the array i found myself looking in the background being like if I was in the 70s, which one would which I have one picked? Would I guess, yeah. <laughs> but no, he was really good with the with the people. They they also seemed to be enjoying themselves, especially that lady that had her nice quick quick witted response. I think she was a little proud of herself, mm -hmm. which was great, which is lovely. But no, I I did enjoy this one. It's really charming how Buck isn't trying to be funny or put too much on here, and he's just asking earnest questions and letting the people shine as themselves. In this slightly odd, uncommon setting. Yeah, he, even though Buck himself in this was not being like bombastic or anything, it just shows a big difference when you have an actual real presenter on there, like an actual performer talking mm -hmm. to the people, as opposed to just, no offense to like just some of the other people who've appeared in some of these, like they seem bored to be doing it, which makes me bored to watch it. This was on paper a very boring film but having buck henry on there made it better because it, it felt like there was a performative aspect to it that made it more fun next one i think chili was with us for this one i could be wrong um uncle charlie's school for the performing arts long time performance instructor taught song dance and uh, acting uh he did legitimately have some uh, high profile students elliot gould being the one who appears in the show um, yeah, this old guy would sit there and get kids to perform. Bear in mind, it's 1976 or whatever. He would get kids to perform Al Jolson and Eddie Cantor and Carmen Miranda. <laughs> and these kids were doing these 
awesome impressions for kids of these old crooners from days gone by. Um, I, you know, I really enjoyed this. This, you know, I was a theater kid who learned theater in a, in a unique way from how most of my peers did. It was very much an, an older couple getting me to try things. And, and uh, this brings back some fond memories for me. Now they weren't sitting there pointing at me going, give me some Al Jolson, but uh, I enjoyed this one. I really, really did. And yeah, I wish there were more schools like this, but <laughs> there are probably reasons why there's not. So <laughs> Yeah, as a a theater-involved adult who wasn't a theater kid, this was giving me a little bit of PTSD for what happens at the cast parties and everyone starts getting too drunk and just doing shit. "Ah, Can we just talk? Like, we just did performances all week. Can we hang out? And everyone's like, hello, my baby. Hello, my darling. Settle down. Settle down. I don't know. I wasn't the biggest fan of this. But, you know, kids doing funny, like, like actually talented song and dance stuff. I mean, that's all right. Just the way he kept stopping them and moving on to the next one though. I mean, I know that's what his job is, but yeah, that was kind of mad. Yeah. I was on this one, uh, this episode and it's not the worst one. Uh, the old guy was fun, but I think I didn't even really get the joke until it was pointed out like how old timey the song and dance bits were. That he's getting the kids to do. Yeah. It was, it was enjoyable also, you know, as a drama kid. So it, Brought back a bit of Vietnam flashbacks. <laughs> Certainly not the worst thing we're going to see. It was great just for the weirdness of the context of what, you know, when it was. And the, he'd be considered creepy today, but not back then. You know? And for my two cents, this is how you teach children to perform, not uh, not theater games and choo-choo-chas. Just right, uh, exactly. put that out there. Yeah, our next one is Yankee Doodle Dandy, and it's uh, Gary Weiss himself goes on the phone, and uh, somebody's asking him how to uh, how to sing Yankee Doodle. So he he starts humming it, but it's intercut with clips of the cast <laughs> doing physical comedy. I, I, Gilda walking into a wall, Dan Aykroyd gets a, a, a bottle smashed over his head, just a bunch of quick clips like that and then they repeat it and do it again i wasn't big on this one i don't know why they repeated it but uh i the the two folks that were on the show with matt and the third chair uh, i think liked it that night so uh i i actually warmed up to it a bit this time around i feel like i liked it more this time than i did the first time actually because when gilda walked into the wall i cracked up i definitely didn't last time uh i think i just felt it was more of a sketch this time and less uh you know, Gary Weiss film, or maybe I was just desperately seeking comedic relief after all of these short films. Uh, I don't know, but I was really into it. Yeah. Gilda walking into the wall is definitely the highlight. There's no need to repeat the whole thing. Cause I, I think there was maybe one actual new clip and it was just someone else getting hit in the head with a bottle. Um, so yeah, a little long winded, but eh, a couple chuckles and yeah, Gilda walking into the wall was hilarious. Though. The way Jane Curtin took the bottle over the head too, completely deadpan. We're now off to George Schultz's Pips. It's George Schultz, founder of Pips, which was actually a very prominent comedy club at the time. One and definitely one of the first, uh, he's just talking about his, his, his time as a comedy club owner. Um, and then starts telling some stories and then talks about some of his own personal quirks and tics that he's developed over the years. Um, I enjoyed this one. Matt, you did not like George Schultz at all. Maybe as resident stand-up guy uh, with our group, uh, you, you certainly would know more than I would. Where are you sitting on pips this time? I mean, let me clarify. I don't know anything. I, I know very little about anything. But uh, I, I still absolutely didn't like it. Uh, I, I didn't find his stories funny. It, you know, there's no razzmatazz. There's no zazzle. And then he starts talking about his various tics, which I, I don't know if he's real or, or if this is his act. Uh, but either way, like terrible act. And if it's real, you know, maybe lay off a little. Talk about your club or something. But I, you know what? I didn't like that either. So maybe just show me the tics. I don't know. I don't. I don't like it. I don't like the cut of his jib. I don't like the aesthetic of this sketch i i don't like that i don't know whether he's just trying to be funny or not i am uncomfortable i don't like him to open it up as being a guy who owns you know, a comedy club in new york you would think it would be a lot of not that he himself needs to be a comedian but i think it'd be a lot of quick stories that are funny instead it was one really long story not really long but it felt really long 
that was funny. It was a funny story, but told in an unfunny way. And then just talked about his ticks while fishing. I was expecting a little bit more. Not that I expect much from these, obviously, if people haven't been able to tell by now. But uh, yeah, I was disappointed by this. And for me to be disappointed by something I wasn't really looking forward to anyway is saying a lot. He's got to be trying to be funny. I hear, like I'm, I'm assuming he must be trying to be funny, like because it, nothing else makes sense to me. Because some people just wouldn't have these like, oh, but when I'm fishing, it goes away. Well, oh, that's fine. I maybe heard of that, but then like there's too many circumstances with all these other ticks. Uh, I oh. think he's doing bad shtick with a fishing rod. Or he's watched so many Gary Weiss films at this point. <laughs> he's doing the bit where he's trying to be as Gary Weiss film like as he can be. He was he's known, actually hilarious off camera <laughs> no he was actually known for being not particularly funny but an amazing judge of of, of talent like he, that's that's the one thing i've been able to read from a bunch of different people he was not a good comedian at all but had they called him the ear because he was able to uh he could tell almost immediately if someone was going to be a star or not you don't sound anything like me you got it kid <laughs> <laughs> If he was trying to be funny, it's it would came across as just awkward. Maybe it's just something that has not aged as well. And maybe just, you know, somebody using the word retired or whatever, but on TV back in the 70s might have been a cheaper laugh. Whereas I, I like to think, you know, for the most part, people have kind of gotten past that. But I mean, I'm not even sure if that's the case, but... There's got to be some reason this is on TV, and I'm having trouble thinking about what it could have been. We're now off to Ottoman, New York, and it's Gary Weiss. He starts talking about New York, and then various people start lip-syncing to the song. And finally, we see a uh, Gary Weiss standing there with a rat head on, which I did laugh at the first time. But this is the first of two Ottoman, New York shorts, and uh, this is probably the better of the two, but it's not really saying too much for me. I thought it was ass. A-S-S. Yeah, it's a little self-wanky about New York, and it has a little bit of the he realized he was supposed to have a film ready for Saturday, and it's Thursday afternoon, and he hasn't thought of it. <laughs> so he just went in, ah, it's New York, people like this song, all right, cool. And yeah, it's, it is ass. Agreed, Max. <laughs> It, thank you, Mark. And also thank you for like, I, I was just feeling a little frustrated having to relive it in my mind. But uh, you're right. It, my problem is it is super wanky. Uh. <laughs> it was it was just high school. Like if you gave a high school kid a camcorder, this is what they would do. They'd get their friends lip syncing something. And yeah, no, this is about 45 minutes in. And I honestly considered like signing up to go fight in the Ukraine or something. <laughs> <laughs> like th- this one and the last one back to back in the way we watched it but even if I, i'm pretty sure you said keith like the way we watched it was in chronological order correct like yeah there's yeah. clearly themes here and so much of the themes like maybe the whole point is like oh we're going to show how like real people here are but if the real people you're recording are not interesting edit them out this is just lip syncing to a song and then for some reason oh look he's got a mouse on his head like it, it's not funny <laughs> I, I don't i i'm very surprised how any of this is who did he have naked pictures of to get on tv this many times <laughs> even those naked pictures are probably boring and lame too though <laughs> <laughs> all, all the pictures were good concepts but then just poorly executed <laughs> hey when keith and i were in high school and given a video camera we made a french film about the devil stealing your hat yes chapeau can we review that next time <laughs> <laughs> now we go to uh it was a part of the halloween episode buck henry uh getting made up as a woman so it's buck henry in drag this was not funny but i really liked the way it was shot uh buck henry was all in um and uh and and really looked creepily female at the end in, in they, they whoever did his makeup did an excellent job so yeah this one i thought was really well shot and and again buck all in for a gary weiss film yeah i don't know if this is as engaging if it's not buck uh as has been noted previously but the 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 shots the the camera angles the way it moves the way it's put together is definitely a step up in the the film work uh, and I forget, uh, I, I was on this episode too, I forget who mentioned it, but it looks like he's cosplaying as B. Arthur by the end of it. 
Yes, like, that's what I said too. <laughs> yeah. so we're trying to go to like a Golden Girls theme party and win the prize for best costume because he oh. spent money on professional makeup artists. And yes, at least it was somebody trying to make uh, an art short art film instead of just this weird running around with a camera. And no New York guys. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, and the beauty is, at the end of it, he was just, you know, he just looked like a woman. He didn't do anything funny or try to be. Yeah, like that's okay. that's one thing. Oh, sorry. Uh, that's one thing that I liked about it. Like, I am a fan of like drag shows and all that. There's, you know, I've got some friends who do it, and it is definitely there is a real art to it. And I appreciate the fact that it wasn't played up for laughs. There wasn't some big, you know, cheeky gay joke at the end. It was just like this is him at the beginning. This is what the makeup artist can do, and this is how they can transform him. And, I mean, I wouldn't go so far as to say he ended up being pretty at the end, but he did look very feminine. So, you know, I like the fact that it was, for lack of a better term, played straight. He was absolutely transformed. I, I think, uh, the, the yeah, I was sure, sure it's uh, like it's all played pretty straightforward but my god that i don't know what you want to call it the steel magnolia so the blue steel look he gives the camera at the end there he <laughs> is transformed he yeah. this is like james gum and silence of the lambs now like he's wow. he's ready to go he has become um we're now off to uh kids dreams and it's a bunch of little kids in a um in a daycare i believe and they're talking about the dreams they have some of these kids have some pretty vivid dreams I don't know. I like kids. Uh, I, I got a kick out of them t- talking about their dreams, you know, cute little kids and stuff. Definitely in the top half for me. Somebody should make a show and it should be called like something like kids say the darndest things. <laughs> yeah. Like if this is how I'm spending my Sunday afternoon, hanging out at a barbecue with my friends and their kids are telling me this stuff, that's cute as hell. I'm here for it. But in the middle of, Late Saturday night on my live sketch comedy cutting edge TV show. I don't know if this is the right place for this. I mean, this is cute. I, you know, I have a child. Kids are cute. But on the other hand, too, when you have your own kid, maybe it makes other people's kids maybe a little bit more palatable. But on the other hand, you just don't want to see them anyway. I'll listen to my own child. I also have children and, you know, some of the kids reminded me a little bit of some of mine um, and what they used to be like when they were little. Uh, it was cute. It was a little bit fun. I love the little guy whispering in his teacher's ear. I dream about you because <laughs> um, just because I know I taught for a little while, too, as one of my careers. And, and you know, kids do say random, weird crap to you um and it can be funny at times but this was just kind of cutesy um and i don't know if it goes with cutting edge and saturday night live in the 70s i'm not so sure speaking of not fitting in with saturday night live um we now have diane nyad professional swimmer and a swimming coach who swam around staten island i believe um this we said it at the time and i'll say it again i'm almost going to double down this was a 60 minutes profile or something. This There was no <laughs> attempt at humor in this at all. I don't know if this was kind of Weiss saying, you know, this is uh, this is what I can do other than what I do. Take a look. Um, but this was not uh, it was well shot, actually. But it, I just this was the one that I always think of. Why is this here? Yeah, I like this one. It's uh, it was well done. It was interesting. It's actually somebody making a short film about an interesting subject. Does it belong on Saturday Night Live? No. That's true of most of these. So, <laughs> sure. Yeah, the style of it definitely feels very different. It feels like he's trying to do something else. And there, there's some, some cool shots and super interesting person, cool stories. Uh, but, yeah, not really what I want to see on Saturday Night Live feels weird and out of place. And yeah, like very like sports journalisty. 30 for 30. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Some of these, I feel like uh, he's trying to almost audition himself for other jobs in the future. <laughs> <laughs> so he's just like, this is like, okay, now I'm going to try sports. I can be a sports reporter. I can, I can edit sports, you know, reports and, and, and interesting stories about it. Just see what I can do. Yeah, but it was a good little story. I was interested that about this, you know, this great swimmer. Um, she'd done quite a lot. That was really a great accomplishments. And 
she apparently became a coach and it sounds all good stuff but again why it just seems weird in this context of a show yeah interesting woman who obviously accomplished quite a bit has is this humor am i just like missing out on the concept of humor like as an abstract like, <laughs> is that how bad it is that it's making chili question comedy <laughs> At least, at least some of the other ones I kind of realized. And I'm like Rebecca said, it's like he was auditioning for something else where the other ones I can kind of see like, oh, this is so obscure. It makes sense. But this is just like a straight up like sports mm-hmm. commercial, av- you know, advertising this woman. I don't know if <laughs> I don't know yeah. if he was trying to get a date or like <laughs> what of this was good well, for I her. Think, yeah. You know, she got some attention, but why? It's yeah. like even a lot of the the ones that haven't been funny so far have been like quirky or slice of life or they like they're looking at people in very specific circumstances that aren't like pro like this is a celebrity this is a profile shot of a celebrity uh-huh. athlete it's very strange i think one last thing too and i certainly not disrespecting this woman who will do more in her life than I ever will hope to accomplish. But I do find it shocking just the difference of, you know, male and female physiques from back then, like a prime, you know, world-class athlete back then. But like, you know, just the gym I go to, there's probably like 50 women who look in better shape. Do you know what I mean? And like, it's not like they're doing steroids or nothing. Just so funny how much different the look of an athlete back then is even compared to like clean athletes nowadays. Yeah, yeah. There's the smoke I mean, on the bench during hockey games at this point in time. <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering, was this the year for the Olympics? Was he trying to get a job on the Olympic no, recording? No, like, it was still a few years out. Yeah. Yeah. Now uh, we go to uh, some Bob Seeger. It's working on a night, working on the <laughs> night moves. You know, in, in Gary Weiss's defense on this one, Garrett screws up the intro hardcore and they they just give up on him on the booth and cut to the movie. Um, but the, this woman is uh, an ex-girlfriend of Garrett's and she's laying in bed, tearing up his picture and stripping down and looking at the camera. Chili, I know you were there with us for this one. We talked a bit like Skinamax and softcore pornography and whatnot. Uh this is another one. This is uh, maybe another audition piece for, for music videos or something. Um, nice looking woman. Uh, good to see Garrett, you know, getting the girl, I guess, but uh, or giving up the girl. You know, what the hell? Yeah, for Cal Walsh was his dip into the world of softcore erotica. This is his next big step forward. <laughs> it's uh, borderline, I don't know, kind of uncomfortable how long it goes on with no real premise. They never show her and Garrett actually together. There's shots of, like, Garrett on a blue fuzzy TV, <laughs> like, talking like he's talking to her, and then just her being mad and sexy for an entire length of a music video. <laughs> and was, this got weird by the end of it. Like, I, I felt like I needed I needed a break from Gary Weiss at the end of this one. Yeah. I thought that, too. Like, what, what was the deal there? Were they... Was Garrett busy that the only day they could get her or something? He probably filmed this back in like 1973 or something. And she probably said, what'd you ever do with that time you recorded me writhing around in the bed? And he's like, oh, <laughs> uh, 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 no, it's going to be on SNL. It's going to be on SNL. I swear. I swear. And then he just like cropped Garrett into it. <laughs> the fact that they Garrett weren't... screwed up the intro. He didn't know what Gary was talking about. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> it was actually the first time Garrett. You're your ex for something. <laughs> It was actually the first time Garrett ever saw the footage. He's like, what the hell? I don't remember filming this. <laughs> this is a okay. totally different piece if we don't have to sit through night moves. Yeah. yeah and night moves is not the right choice. You know? No, I mean, I mean, it wouldn't be an episode if I'm not shitting on the music, but I don't like night moves anyway. <laughs> yeah. That aside, you know, try to put, uh, you know, pr- recall it mentally if you can bear it and just think about like Donna Summer playing over it instead. Yeah. One yeah, thing I like about- night moves, and I can totally admit that it's not the right song for this no. at all. One thing about Bob Seger, he is the master at putting lots of words into one rhythmic 
beat. <laughs> he, he can really put a he can really put a sentence in there. <laughs> yeah. We now go to the small world terrarium. This is uh, more like the slice of life, the Paramount novelty store. It's a couple that run a. Um, I said terrarium, but it's it's actually an exotic pet store. It's a bit about them and their reptiles. This one sh- should have worked for me. It had all the right pieces, but they weren't there the way some of the other ones were. This is the old lady at the exotic shop meets all the people with their pets. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this one worked before. This one worked before. Maybe I'll slap them together. And uh, yeah, it's just a little flat. Some of the pets are cool. And the relationship that the people who run the shop have with their pets is nice and interesting. But, yeah, this this is a little flat. That frog was neat. Yeah, I, was, I like the frog. There was just enough of the slice of life if there's not going to be a joke to it. The people yeah. seemed nice. I liked when she joked about, you know, the frog wasn't for sale. But, like, there was no punchline. There's no proper ending to it. It was just it was what it was. And I don't know if the concept of, like, exotic pets is less funny now, but... I can't see how it was that funny then either. We now go to one that I really enjoyed the first time and really enjoyed the second time, despite missing a lot of the stuff that I like from these movies. But this is Buster Holmes' New Orleans restaurant where you can get like beans and stuff for like 40 cents. Uh, I I don't know. <laughs> I really like this one. I like the man. I wish I hope the place is still there and I'd love to visit someday. Yeah, uh, just and, and the thought of getting a meal for like a buck is uh, is a really nice thought to me. It's probably uh, days gone by, but I really enjoyed this one. If someone's offering you a meal for a buck in this day and age, don't trust the food. Uh, <laughs> yeah, really? But yeah, no, this is great. I want to eat there. I want to see this place. The the my favorite thing about this one too is like the guy's so genuine about like caring about people and, yeah. and taking care of them and feeding them. That like while he's filming, he's just he completely ignores the fact that he's being filmed on camera and just starts saying hi to people mm-hmm. and asking them how their day is and just being himself. This is good stuff. I mean, I liked the people in it and the food looked good. But same thing. I mean, just because I like the people doesn't mean that it's belongs. There was still no jokes to it. There's no jokes, not nothing funny about it. They seem nice. The food looked good, but same thing. I can't give it a pass after complaining about. So many other sketches that just filmed people with no jokes. A bit of an advert, isn't it? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. But if it's supposed to be just a short film about a slice of life, it worked as that. And uh-huh. this Buster Holmes, is that his name, Buster? Yep. He seems like such a genuine, nice guy that it was yeah. enjoyable to watch him. Our next one is just called Baton, and it's uh, from the Raquel Welsh Dancing Files. It's Sissy Spacek twirling a baton for a while. She's obviously skilled. Uh, I think it's David Bowie's fame was playing over it. Same clip a bunch of times. I mean, baton twirling is, is definitely a skill, but not one that drags me in. Yeah, I like Sissy Spacek, but this did nothing for me. Big disagree on this one. It's like the Rochelle, uh, Rochelle, 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 Raquel Welch. Uh, that was like practice. I thought this one was fucking awesome. It's one of the best things I think we watched tonight. First of all, yes, it is. It's David Bowie. It's John Lennon. They do fame. Second, I, I, I hit puberty again in my 40s watching Sissy Spacek, uh, <laughs> this baton. I thought there was a, a totally different look to it. There was I couldn't believe she played Carrie while I was watching her. Uh, but there was there was more grace. <laughs> my God, more grace. Of course, there was more grace. I have more grace sitting on the couch than Raquel Welch wailing her ankles around at eye level. That was not graceful at all. Uh, but I thought this was something different. I thought this was super cool. Uh, the, it was such an effective use of the music. Like, she's going to fucking you spin that. You go be a star. You go be a star, sissy. Oh, I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's thoroughly enchanting in this. And, like, the, the eyes she's making at the camera, too. Like, she knows you're watching. And I also found where it kept going into slow motion. I could actually sort of like make out how the fingers were working around the baton to make it twirl. And that, I don't know, I found that really engaging. Like, uh, you know, you see people twirl batons and you just see a bunch of spinny, movie, flippy shit going on. And it's like, oh, that's cool. I probably can't do that without hitting myself in the head. But where it was slowed down into slow motion, you know, with fame in the background too, 
Um, you could see like the way it was rolling from finger to finger and some of the moves she was doing. I, yeah, tons of grace. I, I kind of enjoyed this more than I expected. Okay. This is definitely better filmed. I think I watched this one. I think I was on the Sissy Spacek one as well. And yeah, I mean, both beautiful women, but I found this was actually showing off a talent. Uh, and it was a better song. So I definitely enjoyed this one more. All right. And I'm going to have a confession here that um, I've been quiet for the last little bit because I nodded off <laughs> sometime after the frog and woke up in the middle of the pause. <laughs> Uh, what I did catch of her baton twirling was okay. But again, I woke up in the middle of it. I think one of the yells of fame woke me up. <laughs> <laughs> That's not saying anything about Gary Weiss. It's talking about us. <laughs> like, did that frog just yell fame? <laughs> <laughs> <Pretty much. laughs> Our next bit, Broderick Crawford goes home. It's Broderick Crawford ro- roaming around his, his old haunt, talking about what things were like when he was there. Broderick Crawford to this day has legions of fans, and every one of them have disliked our video and called me and Matt shitheads for uh, <laughs> not adoring his work. But I actually, all, all jokes aside, I, I actually really enjoy this one. I do like when older folks go back to their old neighborhood and talk about what things used to be like. And uh, he's obviously a man of the people. They adore him there. So I, I did like this. Yeah, this would be up your alley. You're yeah. such an old man. Um, I did not enjoy it. Um, again, it's New York, you know. Oh, look at this. This we used to be here. Oh, we're here now. If you're not from New York, I feel like it just does not resonate with you. Um, it's not like, oh, yeah, I do remember that being this and that wasn't there. And that, you know, the skyline looked different. You know, the only thing I thought was interesting was that as a kid, he used to sleep in Central Park. I was like, <laughs> what? Um, you know, yeah, sure, Mom, I'm just going to go sleep in Central Park for the night. See you tomorrow. Um, you know, we hardly let our kids out of our own yards these days, let alone, uh, you know, sleeping in Central Park for in New York City. I was on mute at the time, but huge pop for uh, shitting on us online. That, that was <laughs> 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 Now, this feels like I went to help my buddy do something for his grandpa, and then my buddy had to go take a phone call. And I'm just here alone with my friend's grandfather, but he's charming. So I'm okay with it. Um, I feel like I'm visiting someone else's grandpa that I don't know, but he's a charming old fellow with some stories to tell. And my God, do the people in the street love this man. Yeah. I don't know. It was all right. And every one of them have also disliked our video. Um, <laughs> I found it endearing. I'm yeah. kind of at that stage of my life, too, the remember when stage of life. So uh, I really uh, I felt what that man was feeling. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you, Ron. Yeah, you know, I'm doubling down. Broder Crawford can suck my millennial balls. <laughs> <laughs> No, this is the this best. Is funny part. I never said anything bad about Broderick Crawford the whole episode. Did Matt take a giant dump on him? I didn't get a chance to listen to this one. Well, we just didn't like him in the episode. It's, he wasn't a good host. But anyway. anyway. I mean, <laughs> the, the best part about the, the people complaining, like, oh, these people, you know, these hosts are assholes. They don't appreciate, you know, the older generation. It's like, yeah, that's why, like, people are doing a podcast about a fucking show that's almost 50 years old. It's because we don't respect the older generation well, and, of actors. And I have referred people. I said, listen to Matt and I talk about Desi Arnaz, who I believe is older than Roderick, Roderick Crawford was. So. Yeah, but I, I mean, my actual review of this is like, this is nice to see. I enjoyed it more this time around than I did the first time, but this is also isolated watching it. He seems nice, but I do agree with Rebecca. It's still more of... Hey, remember back when the pizza shop was over here and there was a dry clean <laughs> over there? It's like, I mean, that's great. And he seemed to enjoy people liked him, but whatever. Put some jokes in there. Yeah, that's when they wore onions on their belts. <laughs> Which was the style at the time. It was the style at the time. The next one, uh, I know Rebecca was with us for this episode. It's Jack Burns doing Rocky. Matt, Jack Burns, your robo host. Uh, how did you feel seeing old Jack again? It's funny. Even the way he moves, it's like it's not quite it's it's so uncanny. Jack Burns hails from the uncanny valley. Yeah. Just to fill you in, guys, uh, Matt uh, is fairly convinced that Jack Burns, who did the Rocky bit, 
was actually a robot uh, programmed <laughs> to host the show that night. Yeah, you can see that. He moves kind of funny, and there's something dead about his eyes. And at least this one had a theme to it. Uh, um, you know, Rocky would have been pretty new at the time, so maybe this is a parody that hasn't been done to death. I did like his little kitty cat punches; they were pretty fun. <laughs> and when, he was hit, when he was hitting the salami too, so I didn't mind this one. It was a parody that, in the last you know couple decades, has been done to death by everything, but this wasn't bad. I didn't like yes. the fact that they clearly use the same footage of him drinking the egg over <laughs> and over again. Like, if you're gonna do this sketch. The, the grossness is people watching you drink the egg, drink a bunch of different eggs if you have to do it for the sketch. That's the only way you know that this isn't just a regular sketch and it's a Gary Weiss film, though. He has to have some kind of repetition in there for you to know. It's, 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 either, it's either a Gary Weiss film or a He-Man cartoon like they have. <laughs> <laughs> this is the only one that actually elicited a laugh from me of all these Rebecca, did it did it sit any better? You weren't big on Jack Burns. You were kind of yeah, annoyed by him. yeah. I was I wasn't a big Jack Burns fan for sure. Um, uh, after I did actually enjoy this one a little more. Um, I think because there was a bit of a you know purpose and and you and you got it and you understood what he was trying to do. It did have some funny bits um, that were trying to be comedic. So you know there was some stuff there that has been missing. Throughout my whole evening up until this point, mm-hmm. still don't like Jack Burns. Okay. We have convinced the human they call Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> Our next bit is Patty Smith. Uh, I will say that uh, Matt was so happy to see Patty Smith back. Chili was so pissed off to hear what she was saying that I don't think we mentioned the neck brace at all when we were <laughs> recording it. So this is just a quick bit with Patty Smith talking about. Uh, I don't know her struggles or the youth. Um, I don't <laughs> like. Um, I didn't particularly enjoy this one. I'd love to hear Patty Smith talk about things other than strife. I guess I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm maybe I'm missing the whole point, but uh, it's not all hideous out there, Patty. You just don't get punk rock, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. The the more I hear and read about Patty Smith. She's obviously a very innovative artist and all that, but yeah, the more I hear and read about just extremely pretentious and I get that being super pretentious is a big part of being, you know, punk. If you just seem like if you're not fun, then pretentiousness is wasted on you. Right. So like this is, oh, no, this poor musician is, oh, the the plights of Jesus. Uh, like I, what, what? I don't know. This is the worst thing that I've seen out of all the Gary Weiss films. <laughs> Pure garbage. Everyone involved should be ashamed of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> I like Patty Smith. Oh, I like some of her. Don't get me wrong. If I hear a song and I don't ever have to like, if Patty Smith just existed as an artist, I would like a lot more of her stuff. But just know, the more I hear about her, just like get over yourself, right? Uh, yeah. At the time, I think there was a little bit more need to <sighs> kick against conformity uh, than there is now. So this might not be something that ages super well in that regard. But I think being weird was a good way to get, you know, stuffed in a jail cell or beat up back in the day. And so I do kind of see the need to to get out there um, from that time frame. So this sits better with me than that. Uh, I, I like Patty Smith, too. I only noticed the neck brace. I didn't know if it was a, uh, a fashion choice or a function piece. The neck brace matched her cuffs on her sleeves, though, on her wrists. <laughs> yeah. So what was it fashion thing or what? what was it? <laughs> the next one is just a bunch of clips. Gary Weiss didn't shoot them, um, but he edited them, uh, which gets you a director credit, I guess. Sport violence, just a bunch of uh, things from sports uh, at a very violent time in sports. Hockey in particular in the 70s was really rough and tumble. <laughs> No, it was dumb. Uh, And it had like all the subtlety of a hammer to the head. I'm just curious, is your cat unaltered? No, he's not. No, he's he's altered. No, he's altered. Oh, okay. Good, good, good. Yeah, uh, this feels like, um, again, a bit of audition work to either work at a a sports broadcasting company or maybe for some work on a Don Cherry's Rock'em Sock'em video. I don't (laughs) want to go sports violence. I've watched some Don Cherry Rock'em Sock'em videos. They have their place and their time. You know, if I'm seven or eight beers into the point of being stupid enough that people punching each other in the face 
uh, is going to be enjoyable by me. It might as well be millionaires punching millionaires in the face. Our next one is Body Language, and this one is narrated by uh, Eric Idle, and it has a very Python-esque theme to it. Uh, Bill Murray, Lorraine Newman meeting in the park is quite funny, and then various other examples of uh, of, of awkward body language. I, I really enjoyed this one. It's, it's definitely one of the better ones. This feels kind of like cheating. This feels like Eric Idle had an idea for an outdoor sketch, and none of the other cameramen that work for SNL – we go outside. So they just <laughs> called up Gary Weiss to shoot Eric Idle's sketch. This is not a Gary Weiss film. This is an Eric Idle sketch that Gary Weiss filmed for him. It's quite funny, and it is good, but nothing about this feels like Gary was actually involved. He's just the guy with the outdoor camera gear for me. Yeah, it's totally a, it, That's the weird realm these things get into. Are they... Short films or are they just sketches? Because these are sketches. That we're starting to get into a few of them now. Where that that was plainly just a sketch that they did outdoors. Basically, shadow what Mark said. I have written down that clearly Gary Weiss had nothing to do with this, but just lived in the area and owned a camera. <laughs> um, growing up, there was always the annoying kid that nobody liked, but he owned Goldie Gear, so you'd always invite <laughs> him out to play road hockey. That was this. This was not a Gary Weiss film, which actually meant that it was funny. It had a plot. It had an ending to it. It had a punchline. There were actual performers in it. It was good. It belonged on television. I agree. It was a funny thing. The funniest thing I saw on this whole list of Gary Weiss films, it was it was a good one. It, I, I chuckled. I smiled. I enjoyed it. We're now off to Autumn in New York again. This is the Madeline Kahn version. Just her roaming around town, uh, singing Autumn in New York in a few different places. The sound, she's a great singer, but the sound did her no favors at all. Um... I like Madeline Kahn, but this was uh, this is not going on her highlight reel. Yeah, a charming and comedic lady trying to pull off a premise that doesn't really work, and the the overuse of the uh, the little tuning harp thing as a joke gets a little grating by the end. It starts to feel almost like a Family Guy style joke. I really like Madeline Kahn too, but this felt kind of half baked to me. And again, is it a short film? No. I assume his uncle owns some of the rights to Autumn in New York or something like that. <laughs> this is bad. I really have nothing to say about it. Yeah. doesn't belong on television. By this point, I this is drudgery. My one thought was how much did they have to pay to use that uh, digital billboard sign right at the end? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Our next one uh, is the five finalists from the Anyone Can Host contest. Uh, we get to see these folks uh, a few times throughout their episode. This was a highlight where we really got to see all five sort of shine on their own. And of course, they're accompanied by Buck. Uh, they're meeting him in his hotel room. Uh, a lot of this was not so much ad lib, but they they come up with a lot of this stuff themselves. Uh, and uh, I thought this was really good. There were some really good moments. Um, everybody shined, I thought, and really showed the personality really well in this. In the context of the episode it aired, I thought they were bang on. I really enjoyed this as well. I, I liked, uh, I didn't, much more than the Anyone Can Host episode itself, I liked the lead up to it, uh, the drama and the contestants. Uh, my favorites being the governor and the Vassar student. Uh, I don't know, it was fun. it's just funny trying to bribe Buck with sexual favors and rings, like like he's running the huh. show. I got a really good kick out of it. If Gary Weiss is an anime character, this feels like his ultimate final form. There's mm. elements of slice of life. There's elements of sketch. There's elements of it just sort of being a little like normal people being flat, but it works. And Buck Henry is in it selling the shit out of the whole thing. This mm. feels like the pinnacle of what a Gary Weiss film could be. And it's quite good. I really enjoy it. Buck sells the shit out of it. They're all very different in their own way. That works really well, too. Like, they all have a very different angle. And, uh, yeah, no, I think this is fantastic. Yeah, knowing this is part of the Anyone Can Host thing, I, you know, I'm i sure maybe Gary White wrote it. Or is this just something where he, once again, just provided the camera and all the other people <laughs> did the work? Yeah, I think uh, he just he basically shot it and framed it and edited it. But uh, the, the writing was all done by... Uh, the folks themselves and Buck and a little bit of assistance from from the, the the writers. So I mean, this is the second one in a row, and it's you know it's almost like as we're getting 
not second one in a row. There's the Autumn in New York, but this one and the Eric Idle one, and even the one coming up next with Steve Martin, kind of seems a bit more like they may have said, you know what, Gary, uh, we'll give you a few spots, but every once in a while, like, can you just film some of the stuff we want to do? Not surprisingly, this is a good one, but it also is one that did not feel like a quote unquote Gary Weiss film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and that is the director's role a lot of the time too. So you know, there's there's that part of it as well. Okay, so now we go to Steve Martin, Homes of the Stars. Steve Martin goes to a lady, uh, buys a star map where you can see where all the celebrities live around Hollywood, and he travels around to, to the different houses, uh, visiting his quote unquote close personal friends, uh, many of them who actually are his friends, um, who don't come out to see him. He does get to see one of Sonny Bono's caretakers, who he introduces as Sonny and gets a big laugh, and a German shepherd who he identifies as Rin Tin Tin. I didn't particularly enjoy this the first time I saw it. I liked it this time. Um, my favorite part, though, is Steve Martin yelling at Ray Kroc's home. Hey, Kroc, Kroc. I just got a kick out of that. But yeah, so this one, not bad certainly not towards the bottom of the barrel but uh, not not as good as i think steve martin could be with uh, with a map of the stars the joke with rin tin tin being the only one to come out to say hi that got a pretty good laugh out of me outside of that we're just kind of banking on steve martin being charismatic and you know that's fine uh there's not a whole lot else going on in here though it's kind of flat and steve martin is great so he carries it cute little premise wasn't you know any anything stellar certainly wasn't the best on this list but i liked it maybe i'm a little bit evil in some ways but one of the points i liked about this one was when uh he goes up to the lady and uh he gets knocked down a little peg because she's like oh i don't remember who you are but i know i should know you (laughs) he's george carlin (laughs) yeah um but it was it was okay it was better than some of the other things we've seen this evening and i think it has potential and maybe if this was something revisited it could have been even better the thing i found i guess i'll say fascinating about this one is that steve martin's career is so much different from when he started to where he Mm -hmm. is now like now he's like super selective about stuff he does where he appears whereas back then he literally is like hey steve we're gonna get this guy to follow you around with the camera, you go and like yell at houses. Like, I don't think he'd be caught dead doing that now. <laughs> and I do enjoy Steve Martin so much more now than like back in that point in time. And like, yeah, I don't know. This was just, I didn't find it funny. I've, this is probably the least I've ever laughed at anything Steve Martin has done. And that's including like footage of him at like John Candy's funeral. Like this was, was just, I was going to say 1994's uh, AIDS epic. The band played on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, it just wasn't funny. It, it felt kind of, I don't know, it kind of felt like desperate. And even at that point in time, Steve Martin was too big of a star to be doing this type of stuff. Sure. Our next bit uh, divided the panel. Um, two loved it, one hated it. It's The Voice. And Lorraine Newman is uh, doing her, going about her regular day, and she starts hearing a sort of high pitched horror movie voice that's singing, sing commenting on what's happening in her life. Uh, again, this time through, I loved it. I, I thought it was hilarious. Uh, Valerie Bromfield is the singer in it. Um, yeah, Matt, you lo- really liked it. I mean, we always think of uh, Lorraine as as, the, as the, the scream queen that never was, and I think we got to see that perfectly here. That's exactly uh, what I thought when I watched it. What robbery has been committed upon us? It should have been. She's so good at it, and I still liked it. I liked it again. Boo. <laughs> no, guys, I still did not like it. Uh, at one point, I finally was like, nope, I got to get to the end of this. And I fast forwarded. It's 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 no, I just didn't. I still didn't like it. I, it's not not for me again. Sorry. Uh, I thought it was a clever little joke and well played out well. Yeah, it was good to see Lorraine used uh, pretty prominently in something. You know, Lorraine's my adult crush i didn't like her as a kid as we do the show i'm like i like lorraine more and more and more uh she had great facial expressions in this as usual you know the, the end joke punchline wasn't fantastic but even some of the stuff that the the crazy voice was saying during it made me chuckle so i like this one this was definitely in the in the higher range for me yeah lorraine really sells the uh <clears throat> descent into madness so well 
and you, you're totally right that we we missed out on a a golden age of of mm-hmm. horror films starring this woman. Uh, and yeah, uh, when I, I first wasn't really catching on to what the words were in the music, and when I first clicked in, and something about the not having the laundry ticket when she's at the laundromat is when I first sort of clued in, and I had a good laugh at that. It might have been almost a little too effective. The crazy grading of noxious music, but uh, I was really happy when it was over for that. But I also did enjoy this and, and thought it was a pretty decent little joke. We now go to Cold as Ice, and it's uh, a woman repeatedly killing Stacy Stacy Keach to the song Cold as Ice. Um, this is another one from the I, I want to do music videos files. I think um, it, it didn't work for me, and we've we've only seen this one fairly recently. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I know some people love this video. This is one that some people absolutely adore, and I just don't get it. There's a brief moment that's kind of comedic when Stacy Keach is flailing around with the scissors dead center in his back. But <laughs> outside of that, yeah, I, um, not a whole lot here for me. It is just a music video and kind of a bizarre one. Great tune. I love that song. Yeah, this is the worst of all the let's record a pretty woman doing stuff sketches and maybe the song's okay but it's not as good as you know say fame or not even as good as uh night moves in my opinions but <laughs> yeah i don't know this one just didn't do it at all for me and now we have kind of i guess best way to put it is a dance mashup it's uh tchaikovsky's swan lake tony basil friend to the uh, show at the beginning gets uh adolfo shabadu Quinones to get some guys together and they're going to uh, do some hip hop dancing, some early hip hop dancing to Swan Lake as four ballerinas also do it. And there's intercutting between the uh, two groups, but also the two groups go on to actually dance together. I really enjoyed this one. Uh, you know, this is uh, again, not particular. Well, it actually was kind of funny seeing the two, uh, the two bits together, but like Shabadoo says in the uh, at the beginning, if there's music, we can dance to it. So, uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed this one. Yeah, I thought it was a clever idea. I mean, and I don't think it was supposed to be funny. It was just clever. It was interesting. This is my favorite. Don't say that. <laughs> Sorry. Spoiler. Um, yeah, no, I really enjoyed this one. Head of its time in the sense of ballet and hip hop uh, being mixed together. You know, it's, I think it's great. I they're both groups are excellent dancers in the nineties. They had all those movies of, you know, save the last dance, step it up, all that stuff. But this was great. It was seventies hip hop, which was so funky and cool and like big. And then the ballet with its precision and it's like cleanliness, I guess, of movement. Um, whereas the hip hop was a little, was more like funky, fluid and big. Um, I really, I really enjoyed it. I think the dancers enjoyed it. So that made me enjoy it more. This is a lot of fun. And I tell anybody, like, if all you know Tony Basil for is, like, Mickey, which is a great, it, you know, it is a great song. Like, look her up. She's done so much cool stuff, like, mainly as a choreographer. And, like, I've recently really gotten into the Talking Heads. And, like, she did the Once in a Lifetime video where, you know, David Burns is doing this weird, like, you know, it's so hard to even describe the way he's dancing. It's hardly even dancing. And she was one of the choreographers on that with him. One of the things I looked up on this was that I think it was like a, a dance magazine actually cited this sketch as being like a pretty influential pioneering moment of actually merging ballet with like hip hop, which not that those two things necessarily go together all the time, but you know, it, it's pretty cool that it, that this sketch is referenced as it is. And it was, uh, yeah, this is a lot of fun to watch. Or correct me if I'm wrong, though. Like, the dancing is incredible. It's a cool piece and all that. But there's, like, almost no camera work, right? Like, isn't it just a stationary camera for the majority of it? I think so, yeah. That's so, what makes it a good Gary Weiss film. He has yeah. nothing to do with it. He just sets the gear up, turns it on, turns it off, and, like, did he even edit it? Like, what does he have to do with this piece that makes it good? <laughs> it's confusing. You know, this is a Gary Weiss film. It's an excellent piece of dancing and entertainment and all that, but there's not a lot of film work in it. If Tony hadn't called him to say, hey, I got an idea. Do you want to do this together? Like, maybe she just had no other way of getting this idea of hers seen by as many people as possible. And he just said, yeah, sure, I'll put my name on this. Why not? 
I'll turn the camera on. And that's the end of Gary Weiss. So uh, at this point in time, Gary Weiss is sort of uh, heading off to – he's heading to Hollywood. He will go on to uh, direct some music videos that we're familiar with. You Can Call Me Al video, for example, with Chevy Chase and Paul Simon. George Harrison. <laughs> George Harrison's I Got My Mind Set on You video, uh, Walk Like an Egyptian. He's He does go on to do quite a bit. He seems to be out of the public eye and really looks like he's living on a beach and just like, I don't know if he's into boat building or surfing, but really kind of has this like really cool looking life now. And uh, you can see his stuff online or you can see he's got a website up. Um, just seems to be living the happy life. So maybe he got out at the right time, or I don't know. Overall thoughts on Gary Weiss, gang? I know we've been very negative about a lot of it, but uh, considering the time, the place, and, and what he was doing, any love for Gary Weiss in this room tonight? There's definitely some love. I liked a lot of it. Like I, when I was sitting here, because I've been trying to, uh, I've been chopping down my top five. Uh, on our way out the door here and man i've been staring at my notepad with these seven of them and like shit uh I'm, i had a tough time so there's some of them i really like a lot he's obviously a talented person and knows what he's doing and it's not his fault like hey if i if i make some fucking shitty ass movie and they're like hey we're gonna put it on our big network tv show i'll be like yeah all right let's do that go ahead uh, i don't care that it's the wrong fit for your show put my shit on your show uh yep. because i'm getting a payday i'm getting exposure they're saying my name i'm getting seen now i can go do shitty music videos and those are two shitty music videos <laughs> you can call me al and i got my mind set on you they stink, but whatever. He probably drove a dump truck full of money up to his house by that time. This is Lauren's fault. Yes, yes, it is, yeah. Sometimes we, you know, rag on the music for being a little too safe or bland or boring and all that sort of stuff. At least they tried to get weird. Getting experimental and trying different things doesn't always work, but I can at least appreciate it. And when it did work, it worked quite well. Like, like Matt was saying. And I had about seven or eight that I had to actually sit through to pick a top five. Yep, um, it, when it doesn't work, woof. You know, when it doesn't work, it's it's a lot of the time it's fit for the show. Does this fit? And that is absolutely Lauren's job to say no, like the Diane Nyad swimming lady. That is not a fit for the show. And, and that's not Gary's fault necessarily because it's good at what it was supposed to be chili you've been his biggest critic throughout any softening or are you doubling down i'm just gonna say this i do not enjoy what i've seen of gary weiss's stuff on snl but i do appreciate the fact that he was doing stuff that was different i don't think it was good but i think that anytime something that's different is run through a proper filter it could be good if nobody if there wasn't somebody trying this at the same time he was doing it we wouldn't have so much really cool stuff that came afterwards i enjoyed the body language sketch i enjoyed the um the thing with buck henry and the uh, the people auditioning like there is stuff here that i enjoyed and each time like i know i kind of said this shitting on him mm. but when he was working with other people it was enjoyable, right? How much of it was his contribution for the others, we probably will never know. Uh-huh. But having somebody who's willing to try different stuff with a proper filter is good. And that's, like you said, it's Lauren's fault. I don't blame Gary for doing things. And to be honest with you, I think a lot of the stuff was kind of lazy. But that's the job for whoever's putting it on TV to say, I can't believe you brought this to me and this is all you have. Like, we're paying you to do this and you show up with a guy doing fucking dog tricks. Yeah. But when you have somebody like Eric Idle who wants to work with him, that sketch was good. It was well shot. Even things like the Sissy Spacek, it was Sissy Spacek twirling a baton for whatever it was two minutes. And I found that very watchable. So he does have some talent. And I like that he tried different things. But I'd be happy to not see another Gary Weiss thing again. But unlike Matt, I also liked some of the music videos he did. So he has some talent. He just needs a filter. So is there a star of the night? I mean, Gary Weiss is the obvious choice, but there's some things that didn't work for us. Is there anything in there that really stands out as somebody being strong? I, I think we do have a clear star of the night. Me uh, too, and it's Buck Henry. Yeah, I agree. I think Buck Henry lifted everything that he was in. I do. I agree with that. Yeah, I agree. Get out. 
So let's figure out what our favorite Gary Weiss film is. Hopefully we don't wind up with a tie, but if we do, such is life. So um, I'm going to start with uh, Ron. Can you give us your fifth favorite, your number five? This is where I really run into trouble with this, because how am I judging them? You know, uh, if they're standalone short films, that's one way to look at them. Uh, Are they supposed to be sketches for the comedy show? Are they breaks in the comedy of the show? Or are they just standalone pieces? And like Matt said, you know, it's not his fault that they decided to put them in a sketch comedy show. So I was really torn about how to judge them. And I think I lean more towards completely out of context of the show, just how are they as films? Yep. I think for my number five, I'm going to go with, with Buster and his soul food restaurant in New Orleans. Uh, Chili? Okay, for my number five, I am going with the Sissy Spacek baton twirling. Sissy Spacek is known for being an actress. Now I don't even know if she's known for being a dancer. And this is just a cool thing to see her doing something different and being very good at it. And it was the best music of all those videos, too. Uh, Mark, number five. For me, when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking Gary Weiss films, not things Gary Weiss filmed. So <laughs> I'm going with Buster Holmes as well. Uh, the Soul Food. That feels like just a pleasant, nice little slice of life. I want to be there. Becca. The Garbage, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think The Garbage Men or The uh, Sanitation Engineers. Uh, those good fellows, I think that would be my number five. Matthew? Matthew's number five pick, Lorraine Newman's Descent into Madness. <laughs> the voice. And oddly enough, Matthew, that was my number five as well. Uh, hey, really hey, enjoyed hey, it. I've... We rarely agree on things, and yet here we are. Thank you, Gary Weiss, for bringing Matt and I together. Honestly, like, I, I don't, I don't, you know, and I try not to, you know, don't get me wrong, this wasn't without its uh, comedic charm, but uh, I don't... You know, I learned a long time ago. I don't watch these with the intention that I, I should be laughing. I, I, I check that at the door, the intention to laugh. And uh, I, I just let it happen. And I was just so, you know, I, I'm nuts about these horror movies. And I just thought Lorraine Newman was so damn good. I, I had, had to bring it. Had to bring it. Number four, Ron. I'm going to go with that uh, Taylor versus the plastic surgeon one. I just thought that was uh, kind of a clever, twisty idea. Yeah, yeah, it's one I always sleep on, but I, I enjoyed it when I watched it. Chili? My number four is The Novelty Shop Lady. It was the slice of life with the least boring person in it. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca, number four. Um, I think the funniest person investigation. The funniest person in Irvington? Yes, in Irvington. Yeah, that one. A bit about past the buck um, kind of thing, which I found a little bit funny. Um, and uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. Mark, number four. I'm going to go with Buck in the toilet seat shop. Uh, <laughs> Buck's great. Some uh, fun setting, quirky, weird. Everyone's just like being earnest. It's a good time. Matthew, number four. Hey, Rebecca, Joe Brock's down there. Funniest man in town. Go see him. That was my number four as well. And my number four was actually uh, body language. Um, it did sort of lose a couple points because I, I do think you guys are right about it being an Eric Idle thing with uh, Gary Weiss as the minor partner, but he was still there and uh, and, and it was a good piece. Number three, Ron. I'm going to go with The uh, the Garbage Man. As a short film, it was actually interesting, had its funny parts, really showed characters and had great photography in it. There was one shot in particular with the light rays coming through the garbage falling down chili buck henry and the potential guest hosts it had a bit of a actual point to it and you know it was probably the best of the buck henry and he was good all night rebecca find your new toilet seat because it just you know they wear out (laughs) obviously mark i'm gonna take myself on down to the shop and pick up a poo poo cushion and (laughs) some fake bugs to stick in my friend's salads because that lady's my number three pick. I was thinking he meant toilet seat there for a second. Uh, Matt? Buck transforms. Uh, oh, yeah. I really think that there is, first of all, the, the craftsmanship uh, that 
is used to transform buck is remarkable even though it just it's not it's not that simple guys i don't mean to be like charlie at the whiteboard but there's uh there's a lot of interesting things happening here that i think you notice i think he puffs his lips out a little Uh, i think he bats his eyes a little this is a transformation and i it was delicate and it looked it's so subtle uh, mm-hmm. But my God, when they, they do those few takes of Buck turning at the end, I was <laughs> I was sold. B. Arthur tribute show. My number three is funniest person person in Irvington. I really liked it. I wish there was more like that. And uh, I, I just love small town folk doing small town stuff. And uh, and Buck really brought it there. Number two, Ron. Just as a film, I am going to go with Diana the Swimmer and that whole uh, bit about her career. I thought it was interesting and also well shot. I can't agree with I can't disagree with that. Yeah, that it was it was definitely a good story to tell and, and they told it well. Chili. Eric Idle's body language. I actually do think this was the best thing I watched by far the whole of, out of everything. It had an actual ending. It tried to be funny. It had a theme. It had jokes, but it doesn't quite get points to put it at number one because I do not feel Gary Weiss had enough of a hand in this where I can give it the number one spot because I think he was just basically the guy who recorded it. Definitely heavy Python vibe to it for sure. Rebecca, number two. It is also body language for me. feels more like a sketch, um, which I enjoyed. Um, but uh, it, you know, it's listed under a Gary Weiss film, so Gary Weiss film it is. Um, so number, uh, that's my number two. Mark? I got to go with uh, Buck interviewing the potential hosts. Well, it does feel like maybe less of a Gary Weiss thing. There's some really nice quick close-ups to Buck's reactions and some of the stuff they're doing. There's still some interesting camera work, and everybody has their little moment. It's quick. It's tight. Everyone's got a thing, and uh, I had a lot of fun with it. And and a lot of the sins of that, I think, are, are hidden in the editing. You can see that on the screen, that it, it did take you know the, the close-ups on Buck, I'm sure, to cover a ton of shit that, that got cut out you know oh yeah all those noobs trying yeah. to figure out how to work there's, there's definitely some masterful editing work done to pull that off and make them all look better yeah absolutely matthew number two my number two selection is uh, buck at the uh, toilet seat store or section uh, number two. because yeah, number two because of uh you know i love how he talks to the people and uh, there, there was ones that i just found more interesting this time one in particular <laughs> and uh gosh i and I don't know, maybe it's just my nostalgia because the toilet seat store is the first one that really popped me when we were watching these films. So maybe I see it through rose colored glasses a little. Um, but yeah, I really like it. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> toilet seats in number two. That fits. <laughs> <laughs> my number two was the Paramount novelty store. That woman was so bloody charming. I miss stores like this. I miss sales folk like this. Number one, I'm going to give mine first because I think it's totally out of the running. I don't know why this one speaks to me, but Taylor Mead and his cat is still my favorite Gary Weiss film. I have no idea why other than Taylor Mead being super charming. I am a cat lover. Um, I've kind of gotten interested into some of the things Taylor Mead has done. He was a, a Warhol hanger on and not hanger on. That's not fair. Uh, just led a very interesting life, and uh, I really enjoyed Taylor Mead and his cat. So the rest of you is, uh, let's go to Ron. Ron, what was your favorite Gary Weiss film? So hard to choose. And, I mean, if you asked me this again next week, I'd probably choose completely different. But um, I'm going to go with the Rocky parody. It, it's the one that actually made me laugh out loud. And nice. I don't like that because then it's just another sketch. And I think they should be about making it's short films but anyway it, it just worked for me and that's well you know in defense of so. that in defense of that choice though ron they couldn't have done that one on a stage you know you needed you, that had to be filmed you know what i mean yeah for sure chili what was your favorite gary weiss film my favorite gary weiss film was the garbage men they seem like nice enough guys it is like i said it is a profession that is rarely not just used as a punchline so i wouldn't go so far as say it had heart like let's say the airport meetings one or whatever so it wasn't schmaltzy but it was just nice to see different points of view there were some funny parts in it 
And even though I didn't laugh or even enjoy it as much as Eric Idle body language one, it is definitely a Gary Weiss film, and it is the best of what a Gary Weiss film could be. Rebecca, what was your favorite, he asked her knowingly. <laughs> yeah, it's my ballet hip-hop. Yeah, Tchaikovsky. Yep. So Gary Weiss goes out on a high note for you. No, it does, yes. <laughs> Mark, what was your favorite? So this is really tough, and you might notice my list is missing some of the most entertaining things, yep. such as Eric Idle body language and the, the, the Tchaikovsky dance. But I'm going for what is a good Gary Weiss film. And when I think of that, I think New York. I think Slice of Life. I think maybe tries to tell a story, maybe doesn't quite get there. And nothing beats the garbage man for that. I'm with you, Chili. It is the pinnacle of what I think of when I think of Gary Weiss. Got ourselves a pretty tight race here. What's number one for you, my friend? Yeah, it's uh, it's not. I mean, somebody mentioned it, but it's certainly nobody else's number one. But my favorite of the evening was Baton, aka Sissy SpaceX Fame. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought it was the the artsy shit he kept trying to do, distilled correctly and perfectly, and with the perfect actress to do it. I thought it was flawless. So we have a tie for third. And just looking at these, there's there's obviously a trend here. We do seem to like Gary Weiss. When he's doing uh, stuff where people are talking to, uh, where but mainly Buck Henry is out <laughs> talking to people. Um, so our, our top four, I suppose, uh, with a, a tie for third place. Uh, tied for third with nine points, uh, we have Toilet Seats and Paramount Novelty. Are we happy with that? Yes. They both deserve to be on the list. So even if they're squeezing in together, I'm happy about that. Don't say squeezing in Toilet Seats. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth the poopy cushion don't don't worry about it <laughs> <laughs> number two is uh a, is body language are we are we content with that being number two i'm not super content with it i think it's wildly different than uh the rest of them and it's, uh it kind of holds up to the point that it's uh that maybe this was a bit too more very much collaborate -y. but uh but you know also whatever it's certainly the best of everything we looked at, I think. It might be the most entertaining thing and the funniest thing that we watched all day today, but it does feel a little bit like cheating. Like someone got their older brother to help them with their homework. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, I think we all liked this with 14 points is garbage. Um, I'm very happy with that choice, though it wasn't on my top five at all. Yeah, that was my number one, so I think that definitely is uh, a good spot for it. Agreed. Gary Weiss at his Gary Weissiest. Great choice. I think the the lesson I'm learning here is that if Buck Henry is in your Gary Weiss film, you're going to get at least one point and finish in the top ten. So. <laughs> <laughs> it was part of the whole experimental, when it works well, it works really well, and when it doesn't, it really doesn't thing. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Henry is the safety. <laughs> uh, so that's where we're at. Garbage is the best Gary Weiss film to air in Saturday Night Live in the first three seasons. Sadly, we do say goodbye to Gary Weiss. So uh, thanks very much. This was a lot of work for some of us to go through all this Gary Weiss stuff. And our recording here is taking a little longer than it usually does. But I certainly had a lot of fun talking about it and, and getting everybody's thoughts um, looking forward very much to starting up season four. You'll all be joining us for that. I'm ready. I'm excited. So Rebecca, Ron, Mark, Chili, thank you for joining us tonight. I do think it's kind of funny and no disrespect to Gary Weiss. I've been a little hard on him. I'm glad he did what he did, even if I didn't like all the results. And uh, it is a little fitting, though, that the best Gary Weiss film is still garbage. <laughs> <laughs> well done chili well done thanks everyone thanks guys yeah thanks, thanks guys. so matt and i'll be back very soon with uh, our best of episodes and our stats episodes and then we're jumping on to season four but until then we'll be ripping up pictures of garrett as we listen to the sweet sounds of bob seeger here in sn hell <laughs> <laughs>